everyday injustice. Too many wrong for convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Hello and welcome to the Everyday Injustice Podcast. I'm your host, David Greenwald. For the past 10 years, we have operated Vanguard Court Watches in California, including San Francisco, Sacramento, and Yolo counties. Our goal? Expose everyday court injustices, and now, more broadly, shine a spotlight on injustices in the entire criminal justice system in the form of wrongful convictions, police and prosecutorial misconduct, and mass incarceration. This podcast hopes to take it a step further and highlight criminal justice reform on a national level. Everyday injustice. Today on Everyday Injustice, we have Jason Smith. He is the executive director of the Michigan Center for Youth Justice. Welcome, Jason. Uh, thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Um, so. Tell us what the Michigan Center for Youth Justice does. So Michigan Center for Youth Justice, we are, gosh, a a 60 plus year old organization um, that for most of our history focused on both uh, issues in the adult criminal justice and youth justice space. But in recent years um, have really shifted our focus, had a name change because of it and all of that uh, to focusing exclusively on legislation and policy reforms that impact young people who come in contact with the juvenile justice system. Young people, children, and and, and young adults, we like to say. Um, And and our goal is to make sure that the system is fair, effective, um, reduces or prevents harm to young people who become system involved, but then also provide them opportunities to thrive, especially once uh, any kind of justice system involvement or court supervision ends. Why is it so important that we treat young people who get system involved differently than we we treat adults? I mean, I'd argue that we we should treat all people um, who come in contact with the justice system fair and effectively, and that yields the best results, right? Um, but especially young people, um, they are, are at a stage in their life when they have the the most opportunity to change to. Uh, become healthy, thriving adults. And so uh, the resources, um, the efforts within the juvenile justice system should be targeted towards making sure that young people stay or get on the track to um, successful adulthood. It should never be a vehicle um, to the adult criminal justice system. Um, Really should be providing the interventions to this young person, recognizing that a, a, a child or a young person is still very much um, a dependent u- a member of their family unit. And so uh, to successfully treat a young person, you will have to often have to uh, engage and collaborate with their entire family or, or the other uh, institutions that they touch, such as schools or community mental health or child welfare. Um, there's just so so much much you can do um, to really uh, help support a, a young person and address their needs um, in a way that that the adult system that's so punitive focused and so focused o- solely on the individual and, and what they did you rather than what they need um, that it, it, the, a true juvenile justice system youth justice system is like we like to say um, it just it, it balances out public safety with the best interest of the child. That that's a major difference between the juvenile justice system and and the adult criminal justice system. I think. So how did you get involved with this issue? Um, all of my work uh, from college on um, was in the field of uh, youth justice and working with young people who were either in the juvenile justice system here in Michigan or or elsewhere, um, or were at risk of becoming. Um, I did my first internship at Michigan State University with the local juvenile court there and worked as a a juvenile case manager in Wayne County's uh, juvenile justice system in Detroit. 
and um, for a couple of years ran a diver helped run I should say a, a diversion program in Skokie, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Um, I also worked at a uh, group home for girls uh, who were transitioning from longer term residential placements here in Michigan uh, back to their community in Lansing. And so uh, I'm a social worker by trade um, in all of the work before coming to the Michigan Center for Youth Justice, which I've been here for about nine years now, a little over, um, has, has been at the working with or engaging with uh, young people who are in the in the juvenile justice system officially or uh, are at risk of becoming and we're trying to divert them away from it. Are you starting to see changes in the way that youth are treated in the justice system? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, just from the point in which I was doing direct service, which I told you is now like a, a decade ago now, um, to where I am and working on uh, macro level policy work. Um, there, I feel like that difference that we talked about uh, at, at the top or uh, between um, the adult system and the juvenile justice system is becoming more distinct, becoming more clear. Um, there is, is a shift currently underway um, uh, from a, a more tough on crime, over, over-reliance on the use of punitive measures like incarceration or longer term out of home placement for kids to really um, hone in on what research says works, you know? Age and adolescent uh, development leave focused treatment and care, um, expanding uh, treatment options in a young person's community so that they can continue to receive services at home with their families. Um, culturally competent uh, treatment and, and service options so that um, the the providers and the treatment offered really understands the, the whole young person's needs and their identity and, and is catered to uh, support them in, in the best ways that, that they can. Like, I think that there's so much more uh, intention around developing uh, a juvenile justice system. And I, you know, uh, say in Michigan, but we're, we're, we're based, but, uh, but I'd also say nationally, um, there, there's really a shift towards um, a more rehabilitative model uh, that, that supports young people and wants to see them thrive. And, I, and I'm excited about that as an advocate. What do you see as the driver of that? I mean, uh, I, I know watching myself, you know, there seems to be a lot more recognition that you know, juvenile brain development is, is a big factor that uh, we finally seem to understand that, you know, when when you're dealing, especially with a teenager, that you're not dealing with a small adult, you're dealing with somebody whose brain is not um, fully developed and they don't have the impulse control and the delayed gratification necessary. I mean, is that really driving it or is there more? No, I, I mean, I think that there's several uh, driving factors. Uh, the prevalence of adolescent brain science, the development uh, developed science is, is um, definitely uh, a, a catalyst to uh, having, uh, building more support for policy reforms or things that improve uh, the, the juvenile justice system or outcomes related to it. Uh, just a couple of years ago, Michigan, uh, changed their laws uh, to raise the age of juvenile court jurisdiction. So 17-year-olds who up to that point were automatically prosecuted as adults, um, no matter what the offense, um, are now having their cases originated in the juvenile justice system. And I think that, you know, the adolescent brain science uh, helped make that argument that people already knew, you know, and, and other aspects of how societies govern. I mean, it wants you have that information and it becomes more public knowledge that a brain isn't fully developed until mid twenties and that um, young people respond to different things like peer pressure and risk rewards and in, in ways that adults simply don't and that they have the ability to change and the ability to be rehabilitated. Um, like that, it's, a, it's an easy leap to make that connection of, of, of for brain science in that way to understanding why there's other laws, uh, why 17 year olds are still considered children, including uh, serving on a jury and, and just the confusion or, or you know, ridiculousness in that 
Uh, 17-year-old could have been charged as an adult but never sit on a jury uh, or be tried by a, peer, a jury of their peers because of the age limit. Same thing for voting and all the other things that govern our society. You know, I think that the, uh, the brain science uh, research just made uh, it allowed for the general public, the policymakers to make that connection quicker. That uh, if that is true for those other issues, then it's it should be true for how young persons treat it when they uh, get in trouble with the, the law. Um, and I also think that um, there is more, in, not enough, but it, like increasing understanding of uh, the issues of racial disparities in contact uh, when people become in contact with the juvenile justice system or the justice system in general and some of the the impacts and outcomes of that and trying to be intentional uh, around um, addressing disparities at different contact points, um, I, I think has been like an increasing focus over time and, and cost effectiveness, you know, like, are we going to, you know, lock people up, lock kids up and, and remove their opportunity to be stay connected to school and all and any kind of pro social activity they have in the community? Um, at a cost that's much more expensive than serving 10 kids in the community uh, in really effective evidence-based programming, or you know, are we going to continue to send them down that route where they can end up in a very expensive situation where um, they're in prison and incarcerated or unable to work and you know, uh, costing the taxpayers a lots of money in other ways? I just think that cost-effectiveness a shift in wanting to treat young people differently based on the brain science and uh, an understanding of the the impact that system involvement has on marginalized communities, among, amongst many more things, uh, really kind of drives this this change. Over the last, I would say, 10 years or so, you know, it, it, we've seen like a good shift and it's more work to do, but um, we're, we're definitely making progress. At least in Michigan, I can speak for. Yeah, one of the, you know, interesting points that you made was the racial disparities, which, you know, for youth systems is even worse than for adult systems. And then there's the consistent finding that the earlier the intervention, the earlier the encounter that youths have with the criminal legal system, the much more likely they are to end up in it. Yeah, yes. And... Often these are young people from in, impoverished communities, impoverished themselves, um, that have been failed by other systems or other adults in, in their lives and have experienced trauma, um, have been victims before they were ever victimized anyone else, if that's what brought them into the juvenile justice system. And for a long time, you know, uh, and I should stop saying it, I, I should say even still now, um, that those kind of factors that contribute to uh, you, a young person committing offenses just were not, if not overlooked, they were they weren't considered as strongly as a need to address as the offense that brought them in, you know. And and I think that we're in a place where data and evidence based things are, are are just going to be continued push in all aspects of society, and it's going to impact. The, the way young people interact with the, the justice system too, hopefully. Um, so what's the role of your organization in driving some of these changes, particularly in Michigan? So our, our main focus is on uh, policy change, impacting as much um, uh, reform in, to the Michigan juvenile justice system as possible at a statewide level. Um, and so that's, uh, supporting the advancement of legislation. Uh, for example, like we had a full uh, advocacy campaign that we participated in with some with our partners around the state to pass legislation to raise the age of juvenile court jurisdiction. Um, one of the big priorities we have right now, um, which I'm happy to go in, in more detail about, is uh, our governor, Governor Whitmer, established a Juvenile Justice Reform Task Force uh, a couple of years ago to look at all the things that we we have talked about, uh, racial disparities and and uh, waving young people to the adult system, the, the use of um, out-of-home placement or confinement 
community-based care, a, a range of issues a, a around the state with our juvenile justice system uh, and tasked the members, which I was appointed as a member, to um, come up with a list of recommendations for reforming the system. Um, the legislation or the recommendations that are tied to statute changes or legislative changes, we have uh, we play a role in advocating for advancing that legislation. Um, also, any kind of work that happens in state government agencies to implement whatever the recommended reforms are, things that are either statute related or not, we do a lot of work to ensure uh, that they're implemented successfully. So a lot of public education, a lot of um, engagement directly with uh, justice stakeholders and policymakers, all to try to make uh, the, the system uh, better, but then also provide as many off ramps as possible to help young people get their needs addressed without formal justice system uh, involvement in the first place too. That's that that's really our, our focus. And we do, uh, we, we, tr we frame advocacy just as like almost uh, a star that has multiple points um, from public education, legislative advocacy, and, and many te technical su uh, support to local communities that are interested in implementing changes. Um, we, we try to do that as much as possible um, to uh, move the ball on on uh, system reform any way that, that we can. This is probably a trick question, but um, you know, what would you consider the most important thing um, that could be done to reduce confinement at this point? I think expanding community-based options. Um, I think, I mean, we can go down like as upstream as you like on on where those community-based treatment options should exist so that uh, young people can have uh, their needs addressed far before they come in contact with the system. But for those who are our focus, young people who may have had a behavior that is against the law or have, may have committed an offense, um, providing some sort of uh, alternative to detention or longer term residential placement that can serve them in, at home and, and having as robust of, of a menu of services as you can to really develop individualized treatment plans. Um, that was one of the recommendations of uh, the Juvenile Justice Task Force was to change the funding structure here in Michigan to uh, incentivize the expansion of, of a larger continuum of care of services for kids in their communities. Um, and so that's an example of something that we advocate for because we know that uh, ultimately that, that's what you need to reduce uh, out of home placement. Um, and not only that, will it reduce the head count in detention or, or you know, longer term treatment facilities, um, but it'll yield better outcomes for the kids that are treated in the community and provide more diversion options, which is another piece of this uh, uh, legislative package that came out of the Juvenile Justice Task Force as pending in the legislature is to, to allow for state funding um, that's used for, for the JJ system um, to be used for kids even more upstream before they're arrested or at the point of arrest rather than a petition being filed with the court and then, then making the decision around diversion. Um, I, I, those are the things. And then ultimately, even the kids that are in out-of-home placement, when you make those changes and you reduce the overall use of, of confinement, those kids for, for whom they cannot be at home for whatever reason. And this is after you've gotten all the kids who are low risk, who you know can be successfully uh, kept at home, or the kids who... Uh, can't go home for whatever reason because of family issues or, or housing issues themselves. Um, after you figured out another alternative for them still in the community, the kids that are left in um, detention settings or residential placement treatment facilities, uh, because it, it, that's the last option and, and it's necessary for them to be there, I think that the quality of care for them will even improve by uh, reducing the use overall and having more community-based options. And they'll also succeed with uh, with reentry, hopefully in that case. What's the importance of uh, trauma-informed solutions? I think it's understanding that 
young people who get in, into trouble or do things that may hurt others or their community have been hurt th themselves. And often that hurt um, and, and, you know, the issues related to that haven't been addressed. Um, and so I, I think, you know, and I'm not a trauma-informed uh, care specialist by any means, but um, the way that you're, you're going to have a, a young person more uh, be be more receptive to treatment, um, be more uh, accepting and, uh, of accountability, which is an important part of, of youth development, is learning to, to be ac accountable for your actions. Um, you have to address the the hurt and the trauma that they've experienced. So, uh, and that how that's addressed, you know, can vary depending on the kid's setting and the availability of resources in the communities, but it's something that's uh, really important to be, be a part of um, the, the continuum of care for, for young people. As they say, hurt people hurt people. Or, hurt people hurt people. Or what I like to say is it's the victim to offender pipeline that, uh, that, that we tend to think about, you know, people as being, oh, they're either victims or offenders, and, and we don't consider enough how how that is actually a, a, a cyclical uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what, what projects are you guys currently working on? So uh, our main priority is advancing the legislation related to the, the Juvenile Justice uh, Task Force which there's a lot of information that uh, folks could review on our website. It's www.miyouthjustice.org. Um, there were 32 recommendations. Not all of them are encapsulated in the legislation that's uh, currently in the Michigan House and Senate, but the big items are, are related to uh, creating standards for indigent defense in the juvenile justice system, which currently don't exist in Michigan. Um, the, the linchpin of, of a lot of the reforms being discussed is that change to the, the state funding structure, the child care fund is what it's called, uh, to incentivize community-based care and expand opportunities for diversion. Um, an issue that we have really been working on for uh, several years, even before the task force met, was um, to uh, eliminate um, the assessment and collection of most juvenile court fines and fees. Um, just we, for years, had heard um, some pretty hor horrible stories from, from parents that had significant bills, primarily from their young person's stay in detention or out-of-home placement, like thousands and thousands of dollars in some cases. Um, Michigan's juvenile justice system is, is decentralized, so a lot of the, the everyday decisions around how the juvenile justice system operates uh, locally is, is determined at, at the county level. So the assessment and collection of fines and fees can really vary county by county. We've heard some extreme, some extreme situations. We've heard some where uh, counties uh, have realized the negative impact that it has on families and, and decided not to collect anything at all. Um, and so uh, that having that then become a recommendation of the Juvenile Justice Task Force um, to eliminate most juvenile court fines and fees um, the exception would be things like there, there's a victim rights fund fee um, or, or restitution um, would still uh, be assessed to a kid, but everything else uh, mostly being removed. Having that become a, a task force recommendation added a credibility to it because you had, you know, all the stakeholders that were a, a part of that group that included the judges and sheriffs and prosecutors and court administrators and the Supreme Court and others voting unanimously to eliminate that. It, it, it's more than just us advocates or the people directly impacted, which there were members uh, of the task force representing that, the, that population as well. It's more than us just saying it. It's, it's the justice system saying, hey, if we're supposed to be about effectively engaging you, the young people and their families and collaborating with them to find out, figure out solutions to address whatever behavior brought them in to the system, um, charging families uh, thousands of dollars, often families at the margin or whatever, like that that's going counter to your goal and actually uh, creates more harm. I think 
having them sign on to that uh, is, is going to lead to more success, uh, chances of success, which we feel confident about, about, like it making it to the governor's desk and being signed into law. So there's other issues uh, related to that task force that we're focusing on as well, um, both in, in statute change, but then also um, in like some of the changes to departments. There's various committees looking at what out-of-home placement will then look like if you've created a robust community care system. And we're very much interested in that too. Um, so uh, I would say number one is getting the legislation in front of us passed. Um, and then second will be uh, successful implementation of those reforms and others. And then seeing where this foundational, uh, I, I say foundational and transformational uh, policy changes will take us from there. There's a, you know, there's a whole report full of recommendations that can be looked at uh, beyond what's currently being worked on. But I think that this is the foundation to be able to do more, um, track more, uh, analyze how effective things are going, uh, and then move, uh, see where we can move further. So if people want to uh, learn more about what you're doing or get involved, how can they do that? Yeah. So again, I, I would check out our website. We've got all of our projects. We do a lot of uh, reports to support our public education efforts. A great report uh, on our website around uh, fines and fees, uh, work that we did in partnership with Macomb County's Juvenile Court to get them uh, to eliminate fines and fees. Uh, there's a report around the issue of kids who are languishing in detention, but they're but uh, are deemed eligible to go home, but can't for whatever reason, and what to do about that. There's a lot of information about how Michigan's juvenile justice system works and the things that we're working on on our website, which is, again, is uh, www.miyouthjustice.org. And then just check us out on all the various social media platforms. Great. Well, I want to thank you for coming on and uh, sharing uh, your experience there. Thank you. Thank you. This is a um, uh, lifelong passion for me, and we have a great, great team at the Michigan Center for Youth Justice, and we're, we're committed to uh, seeing some really transformational things happening here. Jason Smith is the Executive Director of Michigan Center for Youth Justice. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mouse Quake Barrett for the use of our opening Everyday Injustice. You can see more of George's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com. That's justiceforgeorgepowell, all one word, dot com.